I'm Steve Berry. I head up the Highways Maintenance, Innovation, Resilience, Light Rail and Cableways branch of the Department for Transport. And it's a pleasure to be here today. I, I actually was here uh, a few years ago talking about resilience and flooding and, and some of the events that we've seen uh, across the country over the last few years and some of the lessons learnt. Um, I haven't done a presentation um, just due to the fact that when I started to think about the theme of the event, um, there's so many slides that I could put together. I could actually, you know, probably bore you for hours about, you know, resilience, lessons learnt, etc. So I thought actually I'll just, you know, I've, I've written some notes and I'll, I'll read through these notes. Um, but actually, you know, resilience is really important. Even today, whilst I was going, going to be late, it was to deal with a, an issue on a bridge in London, um, which has actually uh, has been closed um, due to um, some issues. But of course, you know, as part of that, Transport for London had to bring in some resilience and some contingency planning into their operations to ensure that you know roads and the and the um, traffic could continue. So, I am here, and I think it's worth just highlighting straight away in terms of you know, despite what some um, politicians and presidents may say, um, there is clear evidence to show that climate change is happening. And indeed, um, 17 of the 80, 18 warmest years on record have occurred in the 21st century. And each of the last three decades, we've seen hotter than the previous one. So actually, you can start to see already in terms of weather and climate change um, some of the issues that are, are, are facing us as part of our infrastructure. And of course, we all should be quite aware that actually this has a number of implications. Um, implications for, for the United Kingdom and for our infrastructure. There's a strong level of awareness of the impacts of climate change on economic infrastructure globally. Um, this is due to, uh, no doubt, a combination of improved scientific and technical knowledge, greater media interest in the subject, and across, and across um, governments, um, we are now more aware of some of the implications of climate change. Now, I could go and, and give a speech entirely about climate change and some of the actions that central government are taking with regards to climate change. We have to report through uh, an act of parliament in terms of what we're doing in terms of adaptation. I could talk about you know, some of the work that we're doing in the government in terms of the zero to uh, vision to zero strategy, looking at EV charging, looking at you know, how we can bring in um, EV um, vehicles onto the market, but I, I won't do that today. Um, but of course, you know, maybe that's an, another event for CIHT to consider in terms of looking at infrastructure and looking at how, we, how it builds in to the resilience um, picture. But we, we all know that infrastructure um, enables safe and reliable use of our road, rail and transport, and it is vulnerable to the effects of climate change. We've already had some insights into what this means to our infrastructure. High temperatures affecting rail lines, melting tarmac, which causes delays and disruption, flooding from extreme winter weather, which brings additional costs and disruption to services and sectors. Our infrastructure sectors have devolved over time and they, the, to be honest, highly technical and interconnected systems. It's clear that if one infrastructure sector goes down due to an incident, then it has a knock-on impact, it has a cascade effect to other um, areas also in other sectors. For example, if a flood um, damages our energy supply, other services can be affected, causing that cascade effect to happen. To meet the challenge, we need an infrastructure system that is more resilient to these challenges. This requires a partnership approach. Government, public and private and other professional sectors, including engineers, scientists, data scientists, other experts, coming to get coming together to proactively meet the challenges of creating a climate resilient infrastructure for our country. We can't do this alone. It, you know, what I find quite a lot in, in my day-to-day -day job working with, say, highway authorities, is that there's a silo effect. 
Um, and that can't be happening, not now. We have to all work together, public and private sector working in harmony to deal with some of the issues that we're facing. So as an example, um, I go out quite a lot, particularly at winter, our ministers write to all local highway authorities to just remind them of their duties in regards to winter, winter planning, winter contingencies. Um, and we ask a number of questions. We used to just ask about um, salt supply um, because that came out of the Cornby 2010 review. One of the key issues was having making sure that highway authorities had a 12-day benchmark for salt as they headed into the winter season. But of course, over the last few years, we've seen more and more flood events. Um, so, for example, 1516 Cumbria had, had a, a large flood event, so did other parts of the northwest. So we now ask more questions. We ask questions about flood flooding and flood planning. Now, how many authorities come to us and say, well, actually, we only deal with winter in terms of snow and ice. Another team does flooding, uh, flood drainage, flood management, flood planning, and therefore we don't know the answer. Um, and that's not what I was expecting when I asked these questions to highway authorities. I want to be able to say, actually, it is all interconnected. We do need a response with regards to what you're doing on your networks. And that's, that's really key. So that's a key example of where actually there's not a partnership approach and not collaboration, even in one organisation. And, and that's what we want to see more of, that collaboration and that collaborative approach. And there are good examples of where highway authorities actually are working closely with um, their neighbouring authorities through highway alliances. So, for example, the South West Highway Alliance have done some great work looking at um, interdependencies. They've been working closely with other transport providers as well, not just on the road network, but working with the rail um, talks, the rail operators, just to find out actually, you know, if, if something happens on this part of the network, what does it actually mean to the highway network or vice versa? And we've had a number of reports over the, over the years. We've had a, a vast amount of reports. You know, since I've been working in highways, um, since around about 2007, um, we've probably had over a dozen reports looking at resilience, uh, specifically on resilience. So, you know, if I, if I name the pit, pit review, falling on from the floods in 2007, that made um, over, if I believe, around about 72 recommendations to organisations, quite a lot to highway authorities. Um, and then going onwards, we've had, you know, more recently in 2016, the National Flood Resilience Review, which also made a number of recommendations. In between that, we had the Transport Resilience Review of 2014. We had the Cornby Review, as I mentioned, in 2010, all making a number of recommendations. Um, to be honest, I think over the last few years, we've actually been very good as a sector to, to actually build upon lessons learnt and build upon some of the recommendations that have been arising from, from those reports. But actually, I think there's still more that we can be doing. And in fact, the Environment Audit Committee only last year highlighted, uh, they'd done a study on heat waves. Um, and you know, last year was a very hot summer, as we recall. Uh, and one of the things that they was making recommendations about was that, you know, this isn't going to get any easier for transport operators. We are going to get more heat waves. Um, so therefore, we need to start to adapt our um, networks, our, our operations to, to think about these sorts of things. So for example, on the London Underground, they're talking about, you know, what can we do to improve the air conditioning in the system? In terms of highways, they was talking about, well, actually, you know, there are a lot of roads that have been melting. Why is this? Should we be working more closely with the supply chain, with the contractors, in terms of having a more durable mater surface material? So, so there are issues that we, we need to work with um, the private sector and, and other organisations in, in dealing with this. Now, of course, we've done quite a lot um, with, within government and working with other organisations. So, for example, um, working through the UK Rose Liaison Group, we, um, in 2016, produced a revised code of practice, 
well-managed highway infrastructure code of practice. And within that, um, there was a number of recommendations with regards to resilience. And what I would stress here is that, you know, resilience is, isn't just a, a word that we should be thinking when there is an incident that happens. We should actually be thinking about this as everyday business as usual. It should be all part of your, you know, part and parcel of your service. You should be thinking about actually the mitigation of the risk of extreme <laughs> events, including weather, plus other events that we see occasionally that occur on the networks, including um, terrorist incidents and, and the like. And I think, you know, the, the, the risk-based approach that we've asked highway authorities to adopt is really important in terms of thinking about resilience and thinking about, you know, you've got a, um, got to, a, well, you should have all done it by now, adopted this risk-based approach. And as part of that risk-based approach, you should have been thinking about your networks, you should have been thinking about the condition of those networks. And actually, you should be also considering where your vulnerabilities are on the networks. Um, and that ties in back into the asset management approach. And of course, we've tried to help highway authorities um, outside of London in terms of that by bringing in funding. We, we brought in a, a funding element called the incentive element, um, which is worth 578 million between 2015 uh, and 2021. And as part of that incentive element, there's a 20, as you know, 22 questions, five themes, one of the themes is about resilience. Um, so that's how, as government, we are taking this very seriously. We've asked you, coming out of the 2014 Transport Resilience Review, we asked highway authorities to determine what is a transport resilient network for, for their networks for which they're responsible for. Now, one of the key areas that I've seen over the last couple of years is, well, when we ask, what is your resilient network? Uh, and many authorities came back to us and said, well, it's our gritting network, um, which is actually not what we was expecting. Um, we was expecting, there was, there's different types of resilient networks. A gritting network um, isn't a resilient network as such, because of course, you will have other impacts. So, you know, basically for flooding, it might be at the lower level than the higher level. Um, you need to you know, think about that as you adopt your resilience and contingency planning. But we've also done a lot of other work in terms of um, how can we make highway authorities and, and other organisations more resilient. So uh, you know, some, some of the, the work that we've done as part of government working with highway authorities uh, and those have been affected by severe um, weather events. So for example, you know, I mentioned Cumbria in 1516. Cumbria had um, you know, a number of um, bridges that were put out of action due to the um, storms. It was like, you know, more than one storm, Storm Desmond, Storm Eva, you know, I could go on and on. But actually there was a lot of storms, a lot of rainfall, heavy rainfall, and actually it caused issues to, to the network. Um, and that meant that a number of bridges were either you know, collapsed or temporary um, failed. And the river levels were so high that we wouldn't, they wasn't able to open them up to um, road users in, in certain areas of Cumbria. Um, and that caused us concern because previous to that in Somerset, and, and you know, we saw previous to in like 13, 14, the Somerset level flooding, um, there was a number of villages, isolated communities that were totally cut off from anything, any transport provision whatsoever. And some of those, some of those areas in Somerset were closed for a, at least 11 weeks. Um, and actually that caused uh, a mighty concern, of course, to um, politicians and, and of course the residents of those areas. Um, and we thought about this and we thought actually, well, what can we do? Because that is not only as impacting on residents and communities, but actually it's impacting on the economy of, of the uh, local area as well. So in Cumbria, had a similar issue, um, one of the things that they told us was one of the biggest problems is that we can't, you know, we had to close these bridges at this stage because we don't know what the damage is in terms of scour damage. So we thought about this and thought, well, actually, well, can't you just send a diver in? Why can't a diver go in? Unfortunately, because the river levels were so high, they was unable to do so. 
some of those were you know not able to go in for, for at least six to seven weeks um, so that meant a bridge is closed that means there's an impact on the economy so we thought about this and we thought actually is there a different way that we can do something um, so we brought in the what we are classing as the bridge cat um, it's a bridge mobile inspection system it's basically a unimog it's got a crane on the back of a, a unimog which is a high terrain vehicle and actually what it can do is can go either on an embankment it can go either or on a bridge and actually it's got a crane a long armed crane so at least like 14 meters long it's got cameras on on the um, end of the crane and sonar devices as well it can actually go into the river no matter what level that river is at and actually check for damage and actually we can then get real-time information from those cameras which means we can actually um, open up the bridge a lot quicker um, if there is no damage of course so so that's something that we, we've actually been deploying over the last 12 months in Cumbria um, unfortunately since then or, or fortunately depends on how you um, want to say it we've not really had any floods so we haven't tested it as, as fully as we would like but we've actually have tested it in port locations as well and actually it, it, it does seem to work so um, we're, we're now looking at this from a multimodal perspective so the next stage of the bridge cat trials we'll be looking at it from a um, maybe trying to trial in it on a railway network as well um, because you know scour is one of the key areas we also done quite a lot of work in terms of putting remote cameras at various vulnerable hotspots on Cumbria's network so basically what we want we were working with the private sector a small SME company we asked them to you know basically put cameras um, at various locations where Cumbria have said you know we haven't had a issue at this moment but these bridges are quite vulnerable could we look at putting some cameras up which would then actually start to identify if there was a lot of like you know heavy rainfall and lots of like uh, you know some flow coming down the river we could we, they can remotely look at that 24 7 they don't actually have to send any highway um, inspectors out or bridge inspectors to look at that so actually again working in partnership with the private sector and that seems to have worked quite well but we wanted to take that a little bit further so we actually thought actually why can't we just tie in something with sensors onto and, and they have like a <laughs> mobile bridge alert system so we now we, we only announced it um, last last week that we are putting sensors on a number of um, bridge locations in Cumbria but we, what we did we went to the private sector and said how much is a sensor and they came up with uh, quite quite a ludicrous figure and said that, you know over over 150 pounds for one sensor and we said well actually we've got a lot of bridge stock in this country can we make it cheaper so we, we basically as part of the trial we're looking at sub 50 pound sensors uh, with Wi-Fi technology and, and that will be looking at um, remotely in terms of river levels now I know EA or the Environment Agency have already got quite a lot of this but we're actually putting it on the bridges themselves the structures themselves and actually if, if the river level gets to a certain point it then sends an alert out using your mobile phone app it will go to directly to the authorities um, like inspectors they can then start to go and um, you know look at what they can do to mitigate against that risk and try to stop it from um, collapsing failing or being closed so that's a piece of work that we've just started we've also thought about this in a, you know in, in a different way because of course there's a lot of things that we can be doing in terms of resilience and and you know we've seen as I said we've had a number of reviews and a number of re recommendations um, not only to central government but also to local government as well and of course central government wants to ensure because we know um, local government has a, a number of um, resource constraints at this moment in time how can we be uh, more efficient how can we actually work uh, more closely in partnership with yourselves how can we actually make you think about resilience um, slightly differently so th there's two other pieces of work that um, we, we've been doing um, from the national flood resilience review following on from the floods of 1516 we actually um, was tasked by central by the cabinet office to basically look at um, flood hotspots look at you know the most vulnerable 
um, bridges within the country. Um, we've done that piece of work, we have done it now. Um, it's only just been completed. But that identified, just looking at the A and B road network, over 14,000 bridges in England, uh, and, and I stress outside of London, um, that could potentially be vulnerable to flooding, depending on the scenario. So we was looking at a one in 1,000 uh, event. I think actually, if I if brought it down to like one in 100, it'd be more. But if a, a one in 1,000 we looked at, um, 14,000 potentially vulnerable bridges. So of course, as part of our deliberations in terms of spending review, our consideration, we're now looking at how we can make the case for a, a flood resilience fund um, going forward. So we'll be making that case to Treasury as part of that spending review uh, business case. Um, but, but not only that, we, we've also thought about actually, you know, if I can get those sub um, 50 pound sensors, we can actually start bringing those on board across all highway authorities if it's successful. So that's, that's what I feel is, is quite a good news um, story. But actually, we, we also was asked by the technical advisors group um, because their concern was, well, we've had all of these reviews. We know that there's a number of highway authorities that have been affected um, by flood events and, and severe weather events. But actually, is there anything else that we should be looking at? Should we be looking at, you know, because there are a number of authorities in, in the country that actually do not have flood events. Um, but, you know, who knows? They may at, at some point in the future. There actually may not be um, understanding what they need to do if they was put into this type of, type of event. So technical advisors group um, came to the department and said, look, you know, we're, we're a bit concerned that, you know, there are the, you know, the usual suspects in terms of like flooding and, and issues in terms of resilience. But actually, what about all of the other authorities? What are they doing? What, what have they got, well, you know, what is their skills? What is actually, you know, have they got the training in, in place? Have they got the uh, capability, capacity? Do they actually understand, you know, issues such as what their critical key infrastructure is? Do they actually know what actually it means if this bridge fails in their network uh, to, the, to the wider transport um, operations? Do they know actually, you know, and are they working closely with the supply chain? You know, what are they doing? So, so actually, we've been doing a, a piece of work. We commissioned Dr. Hugh Deeming, who's um, here in the audience today. Do Dr. Hugh is here. Actually, Dr. Hugh has had produced, Dr. Hugh Deeming has produced uh, uh, an exceptional report, actually. Um, it's just been submitted to um, government and the technical advisors group. Um, government are considering that report now. Um, but actually, you know, I think on the whole, and, and Dr. Demon no, no doubt can talk to people about this over um, lunch, but actually, on the whole, I think, you know, based on the constraints of um, highway authorities in terms of, you know, like cuts in, in posts, um, funding constraints, they've done a a pretty amazing job actually in terms of you know they understand what it means what actually they would need to do in these types of events and some of the um, authorities that Dr Demon has spoken to um, in in terms of how they've dealt with risks um, have been pretty good in terms of they know you know what their chain of command is how they work with multi-agency providers, so for example through the local resilience forum all the way up and you know everyone knows their roles and responsibilities. However that doesn't mean that all highway authorities do know their roles and responsibilities in this issue and so therefore I think it's important that you know we will share this report across um, highway authorities, we will publish that report in due course and I think it's, you know, there's a lot of lessons that we can be learning from this and no doubt um, Dr Demon will no doubt be able to explain further uh, if, you, if you wish him to do so. But, you know, to conclude, I think, you know, there's a lot of work that is happening across sectors uh, about resilience. I think, you know, as we go forward, I think we need to just understand what actually are the vulnerable 
um, points of your networks and what actually it means for supply chains and actually how we can then all work together in a partnership to make sure that we don't see events like we have seen over the last few years happening again. So thank you very much.